Okay, so the recording has started, and this is like day six of the dynamic programming bootcamp at IIT Gandhi Nagar. Uh, today will be the last lecture of this entire series, and we will be discussing just one concept today, which is DP with bit masking. So before going into DP with bit masking, I would like to first of all cover the homework problems that I had given uh, yesterday, and much before that, I would like to cover just one more concept, and this was like given. I mean, this was one doubt that somebody had, so I thought of covering this as well, and it's actually a very important out i would say uh, i mean you wouldn't really find it in a lot of problems but uh, once you know this concept uh, you won't get tle very easily uh, when it comes to dynamic programming problems right so let me just talk about this concept which is that uh, you know like what should you do when you have something like let's say dp of n comma m okay like these are the highest values like n is going up till 100 and m is going up till 10 to the power 6 let's say right or let's keep a smaller bound let's say m is going up till 10 to the power 5 fine so now if you look at this problem uh, the number and if i tell you that you know dp of n comma m is let's say dependent on two other states uh, one of them could be like dp of n minus 1 comma m like this is very similar to the knapsack problem uh, either n minus 1 comma m or some other dp of n minus 1 comma some k Okay, and k being smaller than m, right? K is less than equal to m. Let's say, fine. So if you have such a DP state, uh, like uh, you know, you have DP of n comma m. Let me put this here. And this is dependent on two other states, DP of n minus one, comma m. And let's say DP of n minus one. comma k where k is less than equal to m okay so tell me one thing uh, like if n is going up till n is going up till 100 and m is going up till 10 to the power 5 so what will be the time complexity of such a uh, you know solution like first of all tell me the number of states how many states are there in this in this problem uh, n into m we have the number of states so how many states will you have in total like this is this these are your constraints so the total number of states will be n into m which will be 10 to the power 7 now if you look at the transition like the transition is just dependent on two other states so can i say that transition time is constant like order of 1 yeah i can say that so i know that my time complexity is what it is the number of states into transition time okay and for this problem like the number of states are n into m and transition time is constant okay so overall the number of operations are just roughly you know 10 to the power 7 so ideally this should be fine like or even if like even if even if this is going up till 10 to the power 8 this should ideally be fine in terms of time complexity right will you agree with me on this that this should be fine in terms of time complexity okay now there is one more thing you know you might say that instead of writing like we have two possibilities either you do dp of n comma m okay and then this is dependent on two other states uh, n minus 1 comma m and n minus 1 comma some k okay and you say that there is another state like dp of m comma n okay and this is again dependent on two other states and the states are pretty much the same you have m comma n sorry you have m comma n minus 1 and you have k comma n minus 1 tell me one thing is there any difference between the two like this state and this state is there any difference and the answer is no there is no difference between the two of them you can i mean you all you are doing is like you are interchanging the two parameters right if this was like you know n into m type of a dp state now here it is m into n type of a dp state but is that different is that different in any way like the number of states are same the uh, the transition time is same as well we are having the same transition but the problem here is you know that this solution this one is much better than the second solution and i will tell you why the very first thing to notice here is that you know n is going up till n is going up till 100 let me use a different pen yeah n is going up till 100 and m is going up till let's say 10 to the power 6 okay 
So the thing is that this DP state will be N into M and this will be M into N. Now I will tell you what is the problem here, okay? And how is this, this solution much better than this solution? Okay, and again, this is not known to a lot of people. Uh, people tend to use this N into M and M into N interchangeably. And sometimes what happens is that this solution, this M into N type of a solution, this gives you a TLE. So I will talk about why it is better to take this solution and not the solution, okay? So the logic is very simple. Let's say I tell you that you have N into M. How do you think this N into M, uh, you know, array is represented in memory? So you will have, uh, you know, you have N rows and M columns. So what happens in the memory at backend is this, that you have a column of let's say M size. This is the first row, okay? This is the first row. Just after this, you have the second row. Just after this, you have the third row. Is this making sense? This is of size M. This is again of size M. Basically you have, uh, you know, a contiguous memory allocated to this 2D array, wherein what happens is that these uh, columns are, you know, laid like horizontally. Is this making sense to all of you? Like this is how, uh, how an array is defined, how an array is like represented at backend. Okay, perfect. Now the question was that, you know, RDP of N comma M, this was dependent on what states? Let's see what, what was it dependent on? DP of N comma M. This was dependent on DP of N minus one comma M. Okay. So let's say I am standing here. Let's say I want to calculate DP of, uh, you know, this is three comma, like considering one based indexing three comma, let's say 10. If I want to find out DP of three comma 10, and if I'm standing here, my pointer is here. Okay. So tell me one thing, where do I have to reach now in order to like for, the, in order to uh, get this value DP of N minus one comma M. I just have to go to DP of two comma 10, right? Is this fine? That I have to go to DP of two comma 10, which will lie here, somewhere here. Perfect. Now there is one more thing. Uh, our state is also dependent on DP of N minus one comma some K. K could be greater or less than M. We don't really care. But tell me one thing, where will this, will where will this pointer lie? This pointer will lie also in, you know, inside some of this location here, somewhere here, right? The first pointer lies here, this one. And the second pointer will also lie somewhere here. Is this making sense to everyone? Okay, great. Now tell me one thing. Uh, this has, this has been told to you time and again that, you know, uh, when we are accessing a memory location in a, in an array, how much time does it take? It, it takes order of one time, right? But the reality is that Although it is order of one, although it is very, very fast, but consider this, if you are standing here and if you have to move inside this, uh, this row and you have to get some value, like imagine how many, how many operations are you doing? Like, even if you consider these as very minimal operations, how many operations are you actually doing? How many operations are you doing? And just give me a minute. Uh, I'll just get my charger. Even if I say like you have to do very, very elementary operations, how many like operations are, uh, do you have to do to move this pointer to this part? The point is that if like you, you know, how many steps are you taking? Like from here to here, you will take M steps. Okay. And then again, you will come back here, like, because you will be adding values. And then for the next parameter, you will again, like traverse around M steps only. Like, even if you have, let's say two M steps in worst case, you're going like three M steps. Is this fine? Like three M, four M, five M, let's say. But how many how many steps are you taking here? How many steps are you taking? Three, three, four, five. Not N. It is actually M. It is actually M, not N. Is this clear? Okay, fine. This was one case. Let's talk about another case, which was like M into N. Fine. Let's talk about this. So you have M into N. Fine, how will this be represented? This will be represented like this. You have N size of this. And then you have another, you know, 
n size of this and you have another let's say n size of this and like this keeps on going ahead Okay, now our DP state, our DP of M comma N was dependent on what? It was dependent on DP of M comma N minus one. This was one state, okay. So now if you're standing here, how many operations do you have to lo like do to get to like DP of M comma N minus one? You are at M comma N, you just have to take one operation, right? Because it's lying at the just, not, not N. You have to go from DP of M comma N to DP of M comma N minus one. So it's just here only. That is just one operation for now. Right. Okay. Now think about this. Now, if you have to go to DP of, you know, uh, let's say M, let's say some K value and K is something like, let's say zero. Okay. You have to go to zero comma N minus one. How many operations did you do here? You went from this to this and you kept on going back. How many operations do you have to like, how many steps do you have to take back to like, you know, go from DP of M comma N to DP of zero comma N minus one. It is actually M into N. Look at this. Uh, you had to go from DP of N comma M to DP of N minus one comma M and N minus one comma K. So both of these parameters were lying in this row, in this row. So at max, you had to do like, you know, M operations coming here, then M, op M operation going here, then M operation coming here and then M operation going here. So it's like around five M. Right. In worst case, this is like five M operations, even though we don't consider them as valid operations, like these are pretty elementary, but can you see that here it is five M in worst case? And here it is actually in this one, it is actually N into M in worst case. Is this making sense? Here in this part, like our DP of N comma M was dependent on DP of N minus one comma M and N minus one comma K, K could be some any, any arbitrary value. But if you're standing here, both of these param, both of, both of these values you can find in the previous row. So they're essentially here only. It's not very far. But let's say I tell you that, you know, your array is represented something like this. You have so many columns. Now from here, you have to go here. Like from DP of four comma N, you have to go to DP of uh, zero comma N minus one. You are doing so many operations like going back here. Although it's like very, very minimal. You're doing very minimal operations by if you're standing here, going from here to here, it's very, very minimal. But can you see even like in terms of these minimal operations, uh, doing something like DP of N comma M would be much better than DP of M comma N. Where like N is less than equal to M. And the, uh, the access that you're doing is something like N minus one and then some parameter K like your DP of N comma M, sorry, this, your DP of N comma M, if it is dependent on some parameter like DP of N minus one comma K, then doing something like this is much better than doing something like this. So is this concept clear? Okay, so tell me one thing, what will you use now? Like if you're given a DP problem, what will you try to use? DP of N comma M or DP of M comma N? When, when you have this condition, exactly. So, you know, especially like this, this is one concept that I discovered from the CACS problem set. Uh, when you submit your problems on CACS problem set, you will realize that uh, this problem set requires you to be very, very optimal. Like, you know, you, are, uh, you should do some optimization before you submit a normal DP problem, right? So you might get TLE in some problems when, you know, the constraints are going up to like, like if the time limit is going up to 10 to the power eight operations, then, you know, even these small optimizations can play a big role. Fine, although this is like really rare, but this concept was kind of important, so I sort of explained it. But now, now you guys get the idea, right? 
that it is better to use dp of n comma m rather than dp of m comma n when n is less than equal to m and this is the type of like transition that you're doing so now if you if i give you a random problem will you be able to figure out what is like the better thing is it m comma n or m comma or n comma m will you be able to figure it out on your own like which would be better based on this concept that we just covered like all you have to do is like represent it in terms of contiguous memory location and then think about it like in worst case which is better the one which is better you you take that one up okay there is one more you know benefit of using dp of n uh, n comma m compared to dp of m comma n so if you have dp of n comma m and you have dp of m comma n and you know it is dependent on like both of these are dependent on the state let's say it is dependent on some one state uh, dp of n minus 1 comma k okay and similarly this one is dependent on dp of k comma n minus 1 tell me in which of these solutions can you do a space optimization can you do a space optimization here yes or no your dp of n comma m is only dependent on dp of n minus 1 comma m so all the states in your current row are only dependent on the state in the previous row so i can do space optimization here this works in terms of space optimization but does this work in terms of space optimization it's like you know when you're looking at the solution you're accessing some any random memory location you you're not even saying that it is in the previous row or it is in the previous column this this row could like go to go to uh, zero as well right zero one two anything it could go to so you cannot do space optimization in the solution so now you know that it is even better to consider this type of a solution when we talk about space optimization so the person who had asked this doubt before the class now does it make sense to you that why your solution was giving tle and dp of m comma n and uh, why it should work in dp of n comma m great there is one more thing uh, when you are implementing the solution i looked at your code and your code did not have space optimization so when you are submitting on cscs problem set although the space limit is very high but uh, when you are coding this dp of n comma m solution do space optimization as well it's always a good practice to do space optimization fine because like even though your time complexity might be fine if you do the same i mean if you have the same amount of memory it will not be fine in a lot of problems so is this concept clear uh, can we move ahead great uh, let's talk about the homework problems now uh, i had only given you one homework problem uh, this was the problem and then we'll talk about dp with bit masking all right so the problem is like this that you have n projects for each project you know it starting and ending days and the amount of money you would get as reward uh, you can only attend one project during a day what is the maximum amount of money you can earn fine so it's basically like saying that you have some you know segment like this is let's say p1 project 1 and its value is let's say v1 then let's say you have another project which is like this and you have a number line okay these are the day let's say this is day 1 this is day 2 day 3 day 4 and day 5 let's say day 6 so on let's say this is day 12 so basically you have projects and these are like you know you have the starting time and ending time fine uh i think is it starting or end yeah you have the starting and ending time and if you are doing a project you have to stay involved in that project from the start till the end so if let's say i tell you that you know you have these two projects uh the value of this project this upper one is 100 and this lower one is 200 so can you do both of the projects together like uh, if you are starting uh, with the first project this will overlap with the second one here so you cannot do both of them together but if you just have to do one of them which one will you do yeah you should do the second one because it gives you a uh, give you a better profit exactly so the question is that you don't have just two segments you have n segments now and you have to choose some of them such that the segments that you choose are non overlapping and the profit that you get at the end is kind of maximized so what type of a problem is this is this like a problem of finding the number of ways or is this a problem of finding the maximum value or the minimum value Yeah, it's actually a problem finding the maximum or the minimum value, right? Okay, think about it. One more thing is that is it better to sort of sort the project? 
like these uh, like sort these segments in some way so that uh, we can process it later on in a better way is it better to sort them that's the first question like we are not doing anything bad if we are sorting them right if we sort them nothing is going to change so like you know your segments could be given to you in a random order like you could have these segments right if let's say this is p1 p2 and p3 okay one minute uh, i think my mouse is not working yeah now it should be fine this is let's say p3 so is it better to uh, you know let's just sort these projects with either their starting time or their ending time what do you think i mean you can process these segments in a random order but it i think it would be better to first of all sort them and then process them okay somebody is saying sort with end time that's one solution fine uh, can you even sort this using like start time and then figure out some solution is that also possible think about it uh, like this is the problem think about any solutions that come to your mind and also look at the constraints so do, do the constraints give you some idea that it could be related to greedy maybe that it could be maybe uh, having a greedy solution looking at the constraints I don't think greedy would work here. Okay, that's fine. Okay, somebody saying state DPF I is the maximum amount of profit that can be earned up to day I, up to day I. Okay, if you're processing in terms of days, then these days could go up till ten to the power nine. So you cannot do like day I. Essentially, this can go up till ten to the power nine. also are we allowed to like uh, end a project at the same time and start a new one like can we do something like this ending a project here and then starting another one let me check if this is allowed you can only attend one project during a day so i think this is not allowed yeah if you're if you have a project like this you can start another project from the next day you, but you cannot start it from the same day okay let's try to do one thing let's try to sort these projects based on the end time fine so how will the projects look like if i sort them on the basis of the end time your first project could be let's say here then the second project will have its end time greater than the first one so it could be like this the third one could be let's say uh, from here to here the fourth one could could be from here to here then the fifth one could be let's say from here to here so this is p1 this is p2 p3 after sorting okay can you see that the uh, projects are sorted based on the end time here okay now think about it how do you define a dp state now okay can you define a dp state like this dp of i is equal to maximum profit till project i in the sorted order uh, when the projects are already sorted can i say that dp of i is equal to maximum profit till the project i can i have a dp state like this
Okay, nice. So tell me one thing: if you if you are talking about like having a DP of I as the maximum profit up till the ith project. Okay, somebody saying, I think we can uh, do it greedily. Maybe we can choose all the non-overlapping intervals in one set and find the maximum profit in them. Maximum profit in them. Okay, the solution that you're giving is like you know finding out all the subsets. Like, check, take, uh, consider any subset and see if it is non-overlapping. Then consider its profit. But you don't know which will be the best subset, right? How do you know which is the best subset when you're when you're trying to solve it greedily? You just have to consider one subset in that case. Like greedy works in this way that you have just one or either two, three, five possibilities. You don't you don't consider all the possibilities. Okay, let's talk about this. Like, uh, you know, DP of I. This is let's say the ith project. This is the i minus oneth project. This is the i minus twoeth project, and this is on the basis of what uh, when they are sorted on the basis of their end times. Okay. So if you are saying DP of I, what are the two choices that you have available for this project? What are the two choices that you have for this project? You either pick it up or you don't pick it up. If you don't pick it up, what happens? Can I say that that DP of I is equal to DP of I minus one in that case? When we are not picking up the Ith project, because it's like you know the best profit that you can get up up till this point then. Fine. This works. What if we want to pick it up? Let's say I want to pick this project up, and let's say this project is clashing. Let's say this project is clashing with this project. Can I pick this project up then? If I am picking up this project, if this project is clashing, can I pick this project up? No. If this is also clashing, can I pick this project up? I cannot. Let's say this project. Okay. Let's consider this possibility like this. uh let's say you have some more projects here let's say now this project is not clashing okay so tell me one thing if this project is not clashing this one this is a and this is b and remember these projects are sorted on the basis of their what end time if i am saying that project a is not clashing with project let's say c this one can i say project b will also not cla uh, not clash with a, uh, not not clash with c can i say this considering that these projects are sorted on the basis of their end time consider it like this like how will how will a clash happen like this is let's say the ith project this is the segment that you have for the ith project let's say some projects are clashing with it and they're all on the basis of like like sorted on the basis of their end time okay let's say now you get a project here which does not clash when will this happen this will happen when the end time of uh, the project that you're considering let's say it is at index j it is less than what start time of i only this this is the condition that we need to check right in order to see whether the jth project is clashing with the ith project or not okay now since we know that you know end of j minus 1 will be less than equal to end of j because all these projects are sorted on the basis of their end time can i say if the jth project does not clash with the ith project all the projects from 0 to j will not clash with the ith project can i say this okay so now tell me one thing if i am picking up any subset from 0 to j as a as a subsequent like as a choice will any of these projects clash with my ith project if end of j is less than start of i and if i am picking up any subset from 0 to j if they are not clashing amongst themselves will any of them clash with the ith project no they will not so can i say that you know just look for the first j like starting from this i look for the first j and see what is that first j for which end of j is like less than start of i and then i will say that dp of i is nothing but a uh, profit of i because now we are picking up the ith project profit of i plus dp of j can i say this because what is dp of j dp of j is like the best possible answer like if i tell you that this is j and this is i and all these projects do not clash with my ith project i just need to pick up the best set here and that will be stored in what that will be stored in dp of j so how much like transition time uh, do i require i have two possibilities 
dp of i is equal to maximum of two possibilities either you have dp of i minus 1 or you have what profit of i plus dp of j where j is what j is uh, maximum uh, max such that uh, end of j is less than start of i can i say this how do i find this j now how do i find this j like if i'm standing on i do i start from i and keep going towards the zeroth index or like this would take order of n obviously to find this j but is there a better way to find this j what are we trying to find we are basically trying to find the maximum j such that end of j is less than start of i and what i also know is that all these projects are sorted on the basis of their end time so can i say end of zero will be less than equal to end of one will be less than equal to end of two and so on all i have to do is like in this array of n times or these projects i have to search for the biggest j such that end of j is less than start of i can i do it using binary search i have a sorted array i want to find the biggest index j such that end of j is less than start of i can i do it using binary search finding this j yes or no i can do it right so how much time will it take to find this j uh, i mean obviously the transition is like constant time this is order of 1 this is order of 1 but finding out this j is how much time order of log n because we are doing a binary search so can i say the number of states are order of n but it, but the transition time is actually log n order of log n can i say this yes or no i will just quickly show you my code for this so that you guys get an idea so this is like i have these jobs basically like these project so i'm taking this input first of all i'm sorting them all on the basis of what on the basis of their end time i am sorting these jobs on the basis of their end time and after that i am defining my you know dp state like this that first of all dp of 0 is equal to arr 0 dot profit because if you just have one one uh, project you just take its entire profit then you have two possibilities the first possibility is to not pick up the ith project then you say the answer will be dp of i minus 1 otherwise you have the other possibility in which you will binary search for the index the highest index such that such that what end of that index is less than your start time i mean i will pass the start time as my value and then what i will do is like i will consider these two possibilities and i will take the maximum so is this making sense to all of you like how can you do it obviously like i was a noob when i did this problem so you don't really have to write this binary search function on your own uh, there is this uh, concept of a lower bound and upper bound in vectors right so instead of having an array here i could have had a vector and i could have done some lower bound upper bound stuff so you don't have to write these binary search functions on your own and this is like a long time back when i submitted this so is this clear to all of you the state the transition uh, the base case what is the base case the base case is this that dp of 0 is like arr of 0 dot profit and what is the final sub problem it is like uh, this dp of n minus 1 because now you are considering all the project what was the alternative for binary search um, okay so the alternative for binary search is this that there are functions like lower bound lower bound and upper bound i mean you can read about it on your own you can google this up lower bound and upper bound and you will get to know how how these are implemented and how they return the same value in in log n time but you don't have to write their code it is already there in like c++ stl or it's also there in java collection framework i believe So first is like DPF i is equal to max profit from first i okay. zero to i pro, uh, project transition is DPF i is equal to maximum of DPF i minus one comma profit of i plus uh, DPF j such that j is the maximum. index 
for which uh, end of j is less than start of i. Fine. Uh, let me like reduce the size. What is the base case? The base case is dp of zero is equal to profit of zero. Uh, let's reduce the size here. The final sub problem is dp of n minus one. Okay, so is this problem clear? Like how can you do it? It's not a great approach, but maybe we could have, okay, so somebody suggesting a different approach, maybe we could find all the subsets of non-overlapping intervals. And for each interval, we calculate the profit and find the maximum from them. Yeah, you can do that, but tell me the time complexity of this. If you're considering all the subsets, what is the time complexity of that? That's already two to the power n. But yeah, that would also work. If you're if you're talking about whether it will work or not, it will. But that's not like the optimal way to solve it. Fine. So I hope this uh, problem is clear. Can we move to this concept of DP with bit masking? Or you guys have any doubts? Okay, somebody is asking, can you give some idea why we went for sorting and end times and why not profit or start time? You could do it with the same idea by sorting it by start time, but you will have to iterate from n minus one to zero instead of iterating from zero to n minus one. That's the first thing. Um, also, the question was, why did we not sort on the basis of profit? That's actually a good question. Uh, we could also sort it on the basis of profit. But tell me one thing. Would you always want to pick up the segment with the maximum profit? Let's talk about uh, an edge case here. Let's say you have a segment, this one. This is what this, this has a value of 10 to the power six. And now inside you have like, let's say three segments. And each of these values are like 10 to the power, uh, you know. Okay, let's keep it like this. Let's say this value is six, okay. And inside this, you have three segments three non-overlapping uh, segments and their values are like three, four and five. Would you want to pick up this segment or would you want to pick up these three? Yeah, you would want to pick up these three. So you cannot sort it on the basis of profit because it doesn't really make sense. If you sort it on the basis of profit, there are edge cases or there are other cases which will fail. So whenever you think about sorting on the basis of some idea or some parameter, think about cases where it will not work. And that's how you decide what to sort your, you know, whole array uh, with, right? And also once you, you know, solve some greedy problems, you'll realize that this is kind of really common. Uh, this is a very common trick when we when we talk about segments. We usually tend to uh, sort these segments on the basis of their end time. Okay, so I see a doubt for a problem having time constraint of one second. Say the time complexity of an algorithm is order of n cube. Then for n is equal to 10 to the power three, it will take 10 to the power nine operations. That's fine. Is this correct? Yes, it is correct. Do we directly substitute n value in time complexity function? I'm not able to understand this like, um, yes, like you have to find out the worst case, right? So if you're saying time complexity is order of n cube, and if n is going up till 10 to the power three, you will not substitute n as 100. You will not substitute n as 500. You will consider the the worst case and that is how you decide whether your algorithm will work or not so yes when we when you talk about putting n then yes you put this highest value of n in the time complexity function to uh, find out the number of operations yes uh, was that your doubt like is this clear okay great so now let's talk about this very interesting concept of dp with bit masking right and yeah, for the people who've joined like recently, uh, we did discuss one really cool concept at the starting of this class. So in case you've missed that, I would highly recommend watching the recording of this on YouTube uh, because that was one concept that like, it was really a cool concept. So you should try to learn it as well. 
So let's talk about DPA with Bitmaster and let me. Okay, so there is a doubt. Is it same for space complexity also? Yes, it is same for space complexity also. Yeah, I mean, if you're trying to find out the number of operations or the number of bits in the memory, it's like you have to replace n with the highest value. That will only give you the highest uh, value in terms of time and space, right? And that is how you decide. Like you decide the efficiency of your algorithm on the basis of the bottleneck. You you don't say that if there are five components in your algorithm and if four of them work really well, and if one of them is like an exponent uh, has an exponential uh, time complexity, then the algorithm is fine. You don't say that, right? You always talk about the bottleneck. So you always have to think about the worst case when you talk about time and space complexity. Okay. Now let's talk about this concept of DP with bit masking and let me give you some motivation for this. So first of all, let's say I tell you that, you know, you have an array of N integers. How many subsets does this array have? How many subsets does this array have of size N? If it has N integers, how many subsets will it have? It will have two to the power n subsets. Fine. Now tell me one thing: if you have to store all of these subsets, how will you store them? Like, let's say you know you had this as your array. Also, by the way, uh, Facebook Hacker Cup is running, so you guys can attempt that as well. Like, it's a very cool contest. Although it's really advanced, but uh, in case you in case you guys are watching this video, then or watching this lecture, then I mean you would be already at a great place, great place to like. Uh, you know, attempt it. So if let's say I tell you that you have one comma, two comma, uh, sorry, one comma, two comma, three. Okay. What are the subsets that you have? First is the empty subset, then you have one, then you have two, then you have three, then you have one comma two, one comma three, two comma three, and you have one comma two comma three. Tell me one thing, how much memory are you using here? The number of subsets are two to the power n. Uh, like number of subsets. How much memory are you using here? Like in terms of time, uh, in terms of complexity. What is the space complexity of representing all the subsets here? Two to the power n. No, it's not two to the power n. It's actually n into two to the two to the power n. How many? Uh, how many numbers do you have? It is actually n into two to the power n. Why n into two to the power n? Because like, look at this. The worst case, in the worst case, you will have n elements, right? So the space complexity is what? What? It is n into two to the power n. Okay. Tell me one thing. If you have to, you know, like let's say I give you a subset. Let's say this is your subset one comma two comma four comma six. Let's say I tell you check whether uh, two lies in this subset or not. What will you do? What can you do here? How will you check whether a particular element lies in a subset or not? The first thing is to do a linear search in that subset. Another thing that you can do is like keep all the subsets in a sorted order. Then how much time will you take to search whether two is present in the subset or not? You can do a binary search in that case. So you will, uh, you will, uh, you know, in worst case, at least take uh, log n time, right? So searching in subset best case is log n. Because now you can keep the subsets in a sorted order. I mean, every subset in a sorted order. And then in a subset, you can search in log n time using binary search. Fine. So the space complexity to represent every subset with this man in this manner is n into 2 to the power n. And then to search in a subset is order of log n. OK, fine. Uh, what is the time complexity to insert in a subset? Order of, okay, let's say you want to keep the, uh, you know, subset in a non-sorted order. Like you don't really care about whether the subset is sorted or not. In that case, you can insert in just order of one because you can treat this like a vector. If you have to insert an element, just insert it at the back. So that will take order of one time. But if you have to keep it sorted, it will take at least log in time, right? Like even if you represent these subsets in terms of a binary search tree, let's say. In order to insert an element, in the best case, it will take order of log in time, right? Inserting an element inside a subset. Let's say you had, you know, 
one comma two, and now you want to insert one comma, I mean, you want to insert three inside it. If you don't care about keeping this or uh, keeping the subset in a sorted order, then this will take order of one. You can represent this in terms of a vector. But again, then the searching complexity would become order of n. But if you want to keep both the searching complexity and the insertion complexity log n, uh, you can represent this in terms of a, uh, let's say, binary search tree, right? Like, right? Or you can keep it like a set. So is that making sense? That if you represent your subsets like this, you will have to like store so much. Uh, I mean, store so many numbers, and also the searching and uh, inserting insertion are like order of log n. Worst case. Right. Okay. Let's talk about a different way to represent these subsets, and which is that of you know representing them using a bit mask. So you have these integers one comma two comma three. Let's assign them bits. Okay. So you or let's keep these integers as ten comma twenty comma thirty. So now you assign ten as the. Uh, you can assign it as what? You can say it is the zeroth bit. Okay. Then you say twenty is at the first bit, like the index basically. Right, and then you have thirty as the second bit. When I say zero bit, first bit, and the second bit, I am saying uh, the least significant, like zero least significant bit. So if let's say I have to represent a subset like ten comma thirty, how will I represent this? Or let's say I had to represent ten comma twenty, how will I represent this? So you have three bits. You have three bits. So the first bit, this is the most significant bit, uh, and we, if you're talking about the most significant bit, we will consider it from this side. So that will be zero because we don't have 30 there. We have 20, so we'll keep it as one. We have 10, so we'll keep it as one. Okay, fine. So you represent 10 comma 20 as zero one one. Let's say you want to represent uh, 10 comma 30. How will you represent this in terms of a bit mask? You will represent it as one zero one. Okay. What about uh, you know thirty? How will you represent thirty? This will be represented as one zero zero. Okay. Tell me one thing. When you talk about these binary numbers, can you represent them as integers? What will this be in terms of an integer? This will be three. Right. This will be what? This will be five. This will be what? This will be four. Okay. Tell me one thing. By doing this, am I not saying that you map every single subset to a to a unique integer? Can I say this? That if I am doing something like this, you, that you know, representing every subset in terms of a bit mask, and then converting that bit mask to its actual decimal representation, then I am basically representing every subset uh, uniquely with an integer. Can I say this? Perfect. Now tell me one thing, what is the time complexity or what is the space complexity to store an integer? Space complexity. What is the space complexity to store a single integer? Order of one, perfect. Now how many subsets do you have? You have two to the power n subsets and to store every single subset when you have mapped it to an integer, then what is the time complexity to store that? What is the space complex complexity to store that? What is the space complexity now? It is two to the power n. Is it n n into two to the power n, or is it just two to the power n now? It is just two to the power n. Compare it to this one. Okay, let me give you like you know uh, the representation. Like if you have these subsets, then it's like you know you have an empty subset, then you have ten, then you have twenty, then you have thirty, then you have ten comma twenty. Then you have ten comma thirty. You have ten comma twenty comma thirty. So this is like zero zero zero, which is actually zero in terms of decimal representation. This is zero zero one, which is one. This is zero zero one zero, which is two. This is one zero zero, which is four. Then this is zero one one, which is three. This is uh, what will this be? This will be one one zero, which will be six. This will be one zero one, which will be five. Then you have one, 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 and you have seven. So basically, every subset I have represented first in terms of a bit mask. Then I have converted that bit, bit mask to an integer. So I am basically storing an integer for every single subset. 
Okay, great. Now tell me one thing. If I have a subset like you know, uh, ten comma twenty comma thirty, or basically I have ten comma twenty, and I want to insert thirty in it, what will I do? The initial binary representation was what? It was uh, zero one one. Now I will just say it is one one one. This becomes this right. Ten comma twenty comma thirty. If I want to insert thirty in this subset, what will I do? I will just mark that bit as one. Can I do that? Okay, great. What is the time complexity for doing something like this? It is order of n. We are just changing one bit. Okay. We know where thirty lies. We know its corresponding bit position that we have already defined here. We know the bit position, so we are just uh, toggling one bit. So can I say that this is order of n? Insertion is order of n. Okay, what is searching? Searching time. How much time does it require for you to search? Let's say I want to check whether twenty is present in uh, present in the subset or not. All I will do is I will correspond. I will check whether the corresponding bit is set or not. So this is also order of n. Let's say I want to remove a particular integer uh, from a subset. What is that? Is it is that also not order of n? Yeah, it will also be order of n. No, it will be order of n only. If I want to remove an integer from a subset, it will not be order of n. It will be order of n because what am I doing? Let's say I want to remove twenty from here. All I want to do is like set this as zero. This is order of n. Why? Because like consider it like this. Yeah, I mean it makes sense, right? Yeah. So can I say that you know when we talk about representing subsets, it is better to represent that in terms of a bit mask rather than doing something like this. If you do this, everything is like you know taking more space, taking more time. With a bit mask, this is very 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 quick and very very optimal. So is this is this is the motivation clear to all of you? Okay, great. Now tell me one thing. You know. Uh, If let's say I have a DP state like this, that you know, I am standing here, and I am saying DP of I, okay, and I want to make some choices based on the fact that uh, I mean based on what are what are the choices that I have made from zero to n minus one, or sorry zero to i minus one. Basically, the choice is to either pick up an element or not, and you want to make a choice for the ith element. You want to decide whether you want to pick it up or not based on. What are the elements that you've picked up from zero to n minus zero to i minus one? So tell me one thing: Will you store all of them, like store which which are the integer, integers that you've picked up in a in an array or in terms of a bit mask? What will you do? Will you store these integers that you've picked up so far in a bit mask, or will you store them in terms of a in terms of an array? What will be better? A bit mask is always better because searching is order of one, insertion is order of one, removal is order of one. Then you know, like just representing it is also order of one because it is a single integer, right? So is the motivation clear? Like if I have to perform, uh, if I am considering a DP state like this, that DP of i, uh, you know, the choice that I am making for DP of i is dependent on what have I picked up so far. Then it is better to represent that in terms of a bit mask. So how will my DP state look like? It will look like DP of i comma some bit mask, right? This is how this is how my DP DP state will look like when I'm standing on the ith element. Is this clear to all of you? Like the motivation behind this this concept? A bit mask is used to basically track what are the elements that you picked up. This is the type of problem that we that we're trying to solve. For the ith element, you only make a choice based on what are the elements that you picked up so far. So if you want to keep track of that, instead of representing this like a vector, like having what are the elements that you picked up, and then for every checking, like checking whether some element is present or not, you do another log and stuff. It is better to like represent that in terms of a bit mask, so that insertion, deletion, searching, everything is order of one. Another great thing is that now this is a, this is an integer, right? A bit mask is an integer, so you can represent your entire DP state in terms of what, a two D integer array. But if this was a if this was let's say a vector, what would you need in that case? We've already talked about this non-integer DP state. What will you need if this is not a bit? If this is not an integer? If you have DP of i comma some vector, yes, you will need a map. So what is the problem with the map? Uh, searching is like order of log n, right? 
So even if you have to search whether some state is stored or not, it takes order of login time. So can I say that representing this entire thing in a bit mask is very, very optimal. And now do you get the motivation behind using a bit mask? Okay, great. So now there is one more thing. Uh, what you will understand here is that when I'm saying, you know, uh, there are n elements. There are n elements. So how many bit masks do I need? How many bit masks do I need to represent all the subsets of these n elements? How many subsets are there, first of all? There are two to the power n subsets. And for every subset, I have a unique mapping. Unique integer mapping, right? So how many integers will I need in order to represent all the bit masks, all the subsets? How many integers do I need? I need two to the power n integers. Perfect. So this is one concept that I wanted to talk about, uh, which is the limitation on n. Uh, okay, tell me one thing. If I have, if I've already told you this, that now you will need two to the power n numbers. Tell me one thing, if n is going up till thousand, let's say, can you do this? I mean, can you implement such a solution? Like two to the power thousand integers. Can you do something like this? Is it allowed? Like two to the power thousand unique integers or two to the power thousand different states. This will not work, right? So what is the limit on limit on n for which this might be fine? What do you think? 64. Okay. Also remember that you have to really store them, okay? You also have to store them. So even if you have something like a DP of bit mask, when you are saying to when you are saying 64, okay, actually that's a good point. Okay. That's actually a very good point. If you just have, if you're not talking about DP, okay, if you are not talking about DP, then the biggest integer that we can store in C is actually 2 to the power 64. This is in long long. Now there is one more thing which is called uh, you know, integer 128. Like I don't know how it is like represented. But this long long can be can have 64 bit, but integer 128 can have 128 bit. So at max you can have like two to the power 128. Can you have a bigger number than one two to the power 128 inside inside C plus plus? If you are not considering strings, we are considering actual integers. So can I say that two to the power 128 is the biggest number? Is the biggest uh, integer that I can actually represent? So what is the limit on n, like in terms of representing uh, bit masks? How big can n be if I have to represent a bit mask? I'm not talking about storing all of them. I am just saying just representing some subset. How much uh, can n be in worst case? It can be 128. Perfect. This is for C++ again for uh, Java. If you have, if you're using something like a big integer, then again, this is like 128 only. But now let me tell you one thing. When I'm, when I'm saying that you have to represent bit mask, will I not have to store all of them? Like in most problems, when I'm representing something, I will have to store them, right? I cannot be like, you know, this, uh, this subset is corresponding to this integer, but, uh, you know, I am not storing it anywhere. I have to store these integers, right? In most problems. So tell me one thing, how much memory can you use? Can you use two to the power 128 bits? In memory, this is huge. No, you can use at max up till two to the power 20 or like two to the power 22, not beyond this. Because two to the power 22 itself is something like 10 to the power seven. Okay. So in practice, like uh, practically, what should n be less than equal to when you're talking about representing bit mass? Should it be less than equal to 128? Or should it be less than or equal to actually 22 only for most general practical cases? When you have to actually store all of these things, it should be less than or equal to 20. Just consider it 20 only. Don't even consider 20, 22. Because 22 is like a very weird number. Uh, 20 is some constraint that you can see in a lot of problems. Okay, great. Now, you know, you guys remember that we talked about this concept that once you look at, once you see small constraints, what should come to your mind? What should come to your mind when you see small constraints in a problem, in a competitive programming problem? 
Is it based on DP or is it based on greedy? Yeah, you should always think about DP. Okay, great. Now there is one more trick that I'm going to tell you, which is that if you see n is less than or equal to 20, if you see constraints like n is less than or equal to 15, n is less than or equal to 20, n is less than or equal to 22, like let's say in worst case, what should click to your mind now for constraints like this? Like this. First of all, DP is fine. Like first, first thing that should click to your mind is DP. Then the I mean the first thing that can come is like normal recursion. This could also come to your mind, right? That if n is less than or equal to 15, n is less than or equal to 20 or 22, you could do something like recursion. Normal, like normal recursive solution. That that should also come to your mind. But if that is not possible, the first thing that should come to your mind now is DP with bit masking. I haven't really talked about how do you use this concept of DP with bit masking right now, but we're going to look at a problem. But this is just one trick that I'm telling you right now. That if you see constraints like n is less than or equal to 15, n is less than or equal to 22 or like 20. The first thing that should come to your mind is like recursion. And the very next thing that should come to your mind is DP with bit mask. Is this clear? And now you have a valid reason to consider this because if you have n, is go n going up till 20, then you know that you, know, you can represent every subset with a bit mask and you can even store it. Okay, somebody saying digit DP should come to your mind. We haven't really talked about digit DP. There are other observations for digit DP and I don't know, like I'm not really planning to cover digit DP in this in this series of lectures because it's like, it's hardly asked. Uh, if you look at very advanced problems or some problems from Google Kickstart, it is asked, but it's a very rare topic, digit DP. So, but is this concept clear? Like whenever you see n is less than or equal to 15 or n is less than or equal to 20, you should first of all think about normal recursion brute force and then DP with bit masking. Yes or no? Okay, great. So let's talk about this one problem and see if you can think about a solution to this. So you have been given a list of 2D, uh, I mean, up, uh, you have been given a list of points on a 2D plane, rearrange these points in any way such that in the final permutation of points, the sum of distances of the adjacent elements is minimized. So let me talk about this problem. So you have a 2D plane. You have these points, okay? You are not rearranging these points, like you are not rearranging the location of these points, but you are rearranging their labels. So basically let's say this is point one, this is point two, and let's say this is point three. If this is how I am labeling these points, then this is my actual value. So what has been asked, you have to minimize the sum of distances between adjacent elements. So the first two adjacent elements are one comma two, like on the basis of the label. This is D1. Then from two to three, uh, you go like this and this is D2. So for such a labeling, your actual value will be D1 plus D2. Okay. Now let's say I, you know, Okay, sorry. Yeah, this is actually D1 plus D2. Let's say instead of labeling these points like this, I label them as uh, label them like this one, two, and then three. So this will be like, uh, let's say P1, and this will be P2. Fine. So what will this distance be? Then this will be P1 plus P2. Which is a better labeling? Is the blue labeling better or is the uh, red labeling better in terms of uh, minimizing the distance, the total distance. What do you think? Looking at this example right now. Is the red labeling better or is the blue labeling better? Yeah, the blue labeling is better, the P1 plus P21. Right. So now the question is not just about two points, it's about some n points. These are spread in a uh, 2D plane. You want to label them. Let's say you decide on labeling like this. This is point one. This is your labeling. Okay. Point one, point two, point three. Let's say this is point four. This is point five. This is point six. What will be the total distance? First, you will start from one. You will go to two. Then from two, you will go to three. Then from three, you will go to four. Then from four, you will go to five. Then from four, five, you will go to six. So this will be your total sum of distances. If you label these points like this. Like this. 
fine now you want to decide a labeling you really don't have to decide a labeling but you just have to find the minimal answer you don't have to print the labeling exactly you can label them in your mind but you have to print the minimum answer and if you look at this example if you have like 0 comma 0 5 comma 6 and 1 comma 2 if you rearrange them like this like labeling them like this this will be the best way to label them and the distance will be p1 plus p3 and then p3 plus p2 like this was p1 this was p3 this is p2 so now you rearrange them and they look like this so is the question clear to all of you we are not moving the points you know here we are just rearranging them uh, in terms of the labeling we are not actually changing the position of the points so is the question clear yes or no what are adjacent elements adjacent elements are in terms of labeling so can you see that this is the list of points that has been given to you okay let me remove this this is the list of points that has been given to you now you rearrange these points like this so now the adjacent elements are what the adjacent elements are the 0 comma 0 and 1 comma 2 so you take the distance between these two then you take the distance between 1 comma 2 and 5 comma 6 so is this clear these are adjacent points you basically have to consider one permutation like you have to find out the best permutation okay great what is the first approach that comes to your mind don't think about dp with bit masking but what is the first approach that comes to your mind can you consider all permutations and then you know check which is the best one is that a right solution or not like would that even work yeah that that should work right like that is one very uh you know small solution that should come to your mind so if you look at the constraints n is going up till 15 let's find out 15 factorial so 6 factorial is 720 then you multiply it with uh you multiply it with 7 then you multiply it with 8 then you multiply it with 9 then you multiply it with 10 Okay, this is the number that you are getting. If you consider all the permutations, and the actual number, like the number of operations allowed, is this: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is the number of operations that are actually allowed in terms of you know submitting on uh, submitting the problem on an online judge. But this is the number of operations that you will do if you consider all the permutations. the solution is fine but will this work or is this like uh, you know having a lot of operations is this fine in terms of time complexity it is not fine so yeah think about this now in terms of dp with bit masking let's say you consider these points right uh Okay, I mean, think about it on your own. I will not give you hints here. Think about it on your own for like let's say two minutes.
okay three por- uh, three points uh, correspond to bit mask of size 3 of size 3 yeah i mean in terms of bits yes if you have n points then if you are if you want to represent a bit mask in terms of the set or like a subset then it will require n bits but in terms of an integer the maximum integer that you will require will be 2 to the power n okay tell me one thing if i have picked up some points okay uh, this is your array that you want to fill up with points let's say you filled this point with p7 the point 7 that was given to you in the original array let's say you filled this one with p8 let's say you filled this one with p9 now you filled this one with p11 okay now you want to decide which point to fill here you want to decide which point to fill here what is that information that you should have before deciding what is the information that you need before deciding what point should you put here you already have these points uh, fixed can you put p8 here now again we cannot right we cannot why because it it has already been used so what is that information that you need do you not uh, need to know what are the points that have already been used do you need this information or not that's the first question yes you need that how do you represent it how do you represent which all points have been used already how do you represent it which all points have been used already is this not like a subset only some subset of the original set of points so how do you represent a subset we've talked about this already yeah we can represent this using a bit mask let's say i tell you that there are there were 15 bits or let's say there were uh, like 12 bits in the number 0000000000 and 0000 so what are the bits that are already set here i can say this 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 this first the seventh bit will be set this is the number that i have already taken eighth bit will be set the ninth bit will be set and the 11th bit will be set so this will be the bit mask right that you will have obviously this will be an integer if you talk about this this will actually be an integer we are right now representing this in terms of a bit mask but it will actually be an integer okay so now tell me one thing uh, which all points can you pick up now you can only pick up points which have a zero at their corresponding bit right this should make sense okay now tell me one more thing if i let's say pick up p1 here what will i add to my answer let's say i already know the answer of this one i already know the answer of this much this component what will i add to my answer if i am picking up p1 here if i am putting up p1 here what will be the addition to my answer the addition will be distance between what p11 and p1 is p1 dependent or like is p1 related to p9 in some way are we going to have any relation between p1 and p9 now if there is p11 in the middle we are only talking about adjacent elements so tell me one thing instead of just storing what are the bits that are set or what are the elements that i have already chosen do i not need to know what was the previous element that was chosen is this some information that i will need if i am standing here yes i will need it but do i need this information that what was the second previous element that was chosen do i need this information no so can i say if i am standing on the ith bit i can represent my dp state like this dp of i comma bit mask comma last element can i represent my dp state like this i am standing on the ith element i want to make a choice which element should i choose for the ith element right what is the information that i need to decide for that i need this information what are the elements that have already been chosen before that will be represented by this bit mask now i also need the last element because that is the element with which i will have to calculate my distance of the new point that i am taking up 
is this dp state making sense this dp state is like this uh dp of i comma bit mask comma last element is equal to uh minimum sum of distances in first i points in first i points such that bit mask represents the elements in the first i minus 1 elements and last element uh, represents the last uh, the last point is the dp state fine okay tell me one thing if i am saying this that dp of i comma bit mask comma last element right um yes so now uh, tell me one more thing how will the transition look like what are the possibilities that i have for choosing the ith point i will go through all the endpoints and i will see for which all bits uh, i mean which all elements haven't been chosen so far right and i will try to put them on the ith element is that fine or let's try to you know represent our uh, dp state in a different manner let's say minimum sum of distances uh, in the suffix i to n such that such that bit mask represents the elements in the first i minus l i minus 1 elements and last element represents the last point okay let's keep our dp state like this what i'm saying is this that you are standing here you are standing at the ith element you want to make a choice for the ith element and you know the previous element let's say this was p and you know what are the elements that have been chosen so far you want to decide for i in such a way such that this this answer is minimized or basically not just this but this one because you are also talking about the last element right you will have to add that distance as well so is this making sense dp of i comma bit mask comma last element represents the minimum sum of distances in the suffix from i to n like what are the choices that i should make from i to n such that this distance like distance from p to i then from i to like i plus 1 and so on like this is minimized and we also know the last element is this fine okay now what is the transition check for jth point from 0 to n minus 1 like you have n points so you check for jth point can you pick this up as the ith point or not pick the jth point as the ith element in the final array or not this is what you are doing so what is the first thing that you need to check you need to check whether the bit mask already i mean whether the bit mask has that bit set or not right so you can say if bit mask and 2 to the power j this is checking whether whether the jth bit is set or not if this bit is set if this is like a you know if this is true then you say continue which means that i cannot pick up the jth point now else if you are picking up the jth point how will your transition look like your transition will look like dp of i comma bit mask comma last element is equal to what now you will move to the next element you will say i plus 1 what will be the change in the bit mask now you will say if you picked up the jth point mark that bit as set in the bit mask so how do you do that you can say bit mask or 2 to the power j now what is the last element what is the new last element if you have picked up j right now what is the new last element no not i but actually j because like j is the you know how do i represent this like how should i explain this j is the jth point in the original array and i is the index that we are that we are trying to fill up right now 
So it's not ith, but the j. J is the actual point that is picked up now. Right. Okay. What is the base case? Can I say that if I have reached the end, like dp of n, and what will the bit mask? What do you think is the bit mask going to be when you've already crossed all the endpoints? It will have all the bits as set. So two to the power uh, n minus one. And last element could be anything, right? We don't really care about this now. So this will be what zero because after this, you don't have to choose anything. So can I say this will be the base case? And what about the final sub problem? Initially, what do you have? You're standing on the zeroth index. How many elements have you, have you chosen already? You have chosen zero elements, so you, you haven't chosen anything. And then after that, it's like uh, the last element could be anything, right? So you don't really care about it. If you haven't chosen anything so far, you don't really care about what is the last element. So you can say this is anything. This will be the final subproblem. And also in the, uh, in the transition part, you need to check. Uh, when you are saying this, right? Okay, you also have to add the distance, right? So distance between J comma last element. You also had to add this. And what will you do? You will consider the minimum, right? You are trying to check for all J elements. Like uh, you are trying to check for every point that can be inserted at the ith, ith index. So what will you do? You will say a minimum of this. Is this fine? There is one thing that you're missing out on. What happens when you don't have a last element? Like we are, we are starting from here, right? We are starting from zero comma zero comma anything. So if the bit mask is zero, can I say that no element was picked up previously? So here I can just check that I am only adding this distance. Uh, if you know bit mask is not equal to zero. What does this mean? This means that if the bit mask is not equal to zero, only then there will be a last element, right? If the bit mask is zero, then there will not be any last element. So this will be the actual transition. Is this clear? Any doubts in this? You have a state which is like TP of i comma bit mass comma last element. You are standing on the ith index. You want to fill the ith index and you know the suffix from i to n minus one. This should be n minus one. Such that the bit mask represents the point that you've already picked up so far. And the last element is the last point that you picked up. Now, how will the transition look like? When you're, when you're choosing for the ith index, you will try for all the points, right? All the points that haven't been chosen so far. So you go to all the indices from zero to n minus one, basically in the points array. And you check if that point has already been chosen before. If yes, then you continue. If not, you try out a possibility. Try to put that in the ith index and see what you're getting as a result. And this is the transition. And once you reach the end, you can say that it is the base case. So is this fine? Is this clear? Okay, let's talk about the time complexity here. So you have a state like n into two to the power n because that is a bit mask into n. The state is fine, right? n, this is n. The bit mask is two to the power n. The last element can also go from zero to n minus one. So you have n into two to the power n into n. This is what? This is uh, states, number of states. What is the transition time? 
to calculate one state, how many possibilities are you trying out in worst case? Transition time, TT. What is the transition time for any state? Look at this. You're trying out all J's from 0 to N minus 1. So it is order of N. So what will be the time complexity finally? Time complexity finally will be N into 2 to the power N into N into N. Right? Basically, N cube into 2 to the power N. And what about, spa uh, what about space complexity? How many states do you have? You have n into 2 to the power n into n. n square into 2 to the power n sta uh, state. So the space complexity is this. Is this fine? And let's try to see how many operations are we getting now. So you have n is equal to uh, 15. So the space complexity or the number of operations are n into n into n into n into 2 to the power n. So it's like in Python, you write it like this 2 to the power n. And let's see what is this value. Okay. How much is this value? This is roughly around 10 to the power 8, right? Roughly around 10 to the power 8. So will this be fine in terms of time complexity? Yeah, this should be fine because you're considering the worst case. So not a lot of states will go into like n transition states and we won't really be, you know, like, I mean, you guys get the idea, right? That we're talking about the worst case. So ideally it would be a little lesser than that only. So this will work, but I will give you, uh, give you some optimization here. So let's see, you have DP of I. I is what? I is the index. Then you have a bit mask. And then you have the last element, which is like the J. Okay, let's call it J or let's call it K. Tell me one thing. What does this index represent? This index represent the number of elements that you have chosen in this bit mask so far. Like if I tell you that the number of elements that you picked up so far are one, which index will you be standing at? You will be standing at the first index. If I tell you that you have picked up two elements so far, which index will you be standing at? You will be standing at two, right? If I tell you, you have picked up 10 elements so far, which index will you be standing at? Which index will you try to fill up? You will try to fill up the 10th index when we talk about zero based index. Is this clear? So tell me one thing, can I not derive this I value from this bit mask itself? Can I say I is nothing but equal to set bits set bits in the bit mask. Can I say this? Yes or no? I can say this. So do I need to store this parameter I? Or should I derive it on spot? Yeah, this is state optimization. We talked about this, right? So what is the time complexity to find the number of set bits in an integer? Like this bit mask will be an integer, right? What is the time complexity to find the number of set bits in an integer? In C++, there is a function called built-in pop count, which returns this value in order of one. So can I say that a new state will be nothing but DP of bit mask, comma, uh, the last element. Can I say this now? So what is the time complexity now? It is actually the number of states, the number of states are two to the power n. Uh, okay, let's write it like this. Two to the power n into n and the transition time is n. And what about the space complexity? It is two to the power n into n now. So let's try to see how better this is. Now this is much smaller than two to the, uh, much smaller than 10 to the power eight, right? So this will surely work. This can also work. This is fine, but this will surely work. Can I say this? Yes or no? Okay, great. 
So do you guys get the idea that, you know, this is one solution and we can optimize this solution to this. We say DP of bit mass comma, uh, minimum sum of distances in the suffix from, what is I? First of all, we say I is equal to, uh, I is equal to set bits in bit mass. I mean, you, you can do it in order of one. There is a, uh, there is an inbuilt function for this. Now you say that DP of, uh, I, uh, I mean, DP of bit mass comma element is equal to this value. And what about the transition for transition? Again, now you will not pass I, but you will just say this. And for the base case, you will just say this for the final sub problem. You will just say this. So is this clear? We just have to find this I right somehow and we found it. So why do we need to store it? That's the whole point. Is this fine? This whole concept of DP with bit masking. Let's copy this and put it as a solution. Okay, so any doubts now? Any doubts? Yes or no? Okay, let's do one thing. Let's not, you know, discuss this problem as well right now. I will give you this as a homework problem and then we can discuss this. Uh, when do we have that offline session? We have it on 29th. So we can pick up this problem as the first problem of the offline problem solving session. Okay. This will be like a, like a homework for you guys. But yeah, this is like, uh, this is also based on this concept of DP with bit masking and it's not very difficult. Like problem one would be much more difficult than problem two. I can assure you this. So like you can do it on your own as well. If you're not able to do it, we will definitely be discussing this in the offline session, uh, but yeah, you should try it out on your own first. So any doubts before we wrap up this class? What rating will this, what rating questions will this apply for? Uh, you're talking about DP with bit masking. This can even come in 1800 or 1900 rated problems. And obviously when we talk about uh, even more difficult problems, it uh, usually is seen a lot. Like DP with bit masking is a fairly common topic when you talk about advanced level problems. And these like these problems, problem one and problem two are kind of really easy here. Can you explain the space complexity as n into two to the power n? Sure. Can you look at the DP state? How many states do you have here? Like this DP of bit mass comma last element. This bit mass will have two to the power n possibilities and this last element will have n possibilities. So the number of states are n into two to the power n. And when you're doing a transition, are you storing some memory? You're not storing any memory, right? So all you have to do is just store the state. And to store all of these states, you have n into two to the power n. 
as the state complexity. Fine. Any doubts? Okay, so fine. So like officially this class is over, uh, but we can take up some other doubts like which are not really related to DP with bit masking. So somebody has written, I wanted to ask like when it comes to placement questions and interviews, like placement type of questions and interviews, which part of DP uh, that you taught are more important and most likely to be asked. Um, in terms of interview preparation, I would really recommend like, you know, like having some idea of DP with, uh, DP with bit masking. So I would say lecture six is for everyone. Like if you're preparing for placements, if you're preparing for interviews, lecture six is for everyone. But other than that, I would say one, two, three, like lectures one, two, three should be enough when it comes to interview preparation. Uh, you will never be asked to do things like state optimization. Uh, you will never be asked to do things like transition optimization. You might be asked to do uh, space optimization, but space optimization is like a fairly common topic. Uh, but state optimization and transition optimization are not so common. So when it comes to interview preparation, nobody is going to ask you that. And also one more thing. So you would have seen like uh, you would have seen things like you know uh, non-integer DT parameters. Uh, we talked about that concept. So Nobody's going to ask you that in an interview. It's pretty advanced. And also we talked about cycling DP states. Nobody's going to ask you that as well. Uh, what else did we talk about? Um, answer construction. I don't think anybody's going to ask you answer construction. Although it would be like a good tool to have in, have in your toolkit when you are like, uh, you know, going for an interview or approaching some uh, competitive programming problem. Answer construction should be like very, uh, intuitive. Yes, also game theory type of DP will never be asked. Okay, somebody saying when you explain the problems, I understand them very well. However, when I do it, I don't get ideas. Uh, that is something that happens with everyone. Like uh, when I decide to learn very advanced concepts like centroid decomposition or heavy light decomposition, uh, when somebody is explaining me the concepts or when somebody is telling me that this problem can be solved like this using centroid decomposition or HLD, that time it makes a lot of sense. But the real test in competitive programming is, I mean, it is taken when you are attempting a fresh contest or when you're attempting a fresh problem. How do you implement or how do you use all of the knowledge that you've acquired so far in this problem? That's the main bottleneck in competitive programming. So the point is that it comes with practice. Uh, when I'm able to, you know, talk about DP states and I'm able to talk about so many concepts, like so many advanced level concepts, it is not like this came up. Uh, I mean, I could learn all of this in like a week or a two. I took a lot of time to, you know, learn these concepts. And I did not learn all of these concepts in one go. So in this week of, you know, DP lectures, you would have seen that you learned a lot of concepts together. My journey has been a little different, like all almost like 90% of these concepts I have learned by trying out a problem. Like I looked at a problem, I could not solve it. Then I looked at its editorial or I looked at some YouTube video. And then I realized that, you know, this concept I did not know and I could, I could use it. Now, once I've used the concept in like four or five problems, it remains in my memory. So whenever I see a problem on the same concept again, it is very likely that I will be able to, you know, bring out that concept from my mind. But right now it is very obvious that if you just solved one problem on, the, on that concept or two problems on that concept, and that too, you know, uh, you've not solved it on your own. Like I have, you know, solved it with you. So right now it might be seeming very easy, but when you approach a problem, things really change. So the only solution to this is like practicing a lot. I cannot say anything else other than that. I mean, it's not like this, right? Like if you look at my code forces, I am not able to talk about DP just because I've done DP for like one month or two. If you look at DP, like I have solved 367 problems, which are, which were like based on DP. They had some DP idea. Like out of the 2000 problems that I've solved here, uh, 367 of them are based on, uh, based on DP 
and also it's not like you know these other problems that are solved they were they did not require some dp idea like if you look at some of my contest screencasts you will realize that almost 50% or at least 40% of the problems that are solved i tend to solve them using some dynamic programming idea so dynamic programming is one of those topics that i'm really good at i can say that and that has been because i've done a lot of practice it's not like i've learned some concepts and then i have been able to solve these problems i've learned those concepts because i could not solve a problem right so yeah i mean these concepts they will you know they will stick once you solve a lot of problems on them if you just look at a concept and you you know you don't solve problems on them then the concept really goes away after some time right so yeah any other doubts uh, before we end this okay somebody is asking if the interview is in 7 days or so then should we focus on first three lectures i would recommend focusing on this uh, you know amazing playlist by striver so there is this channel called take you forward and they have an amazing playlist on dp so if you are preparing for interviews i would recommend that playlist if you are preparing for competitive programming i would recommend this playlist right so for interviews don't don't really consider this playlist this is not a good playlist to start for uh, you know like look at for interview preparation this just contain a lot of advanced concepts and we haven't really solved a lot of standard db problems and when it comes to like uh interviews they do ask you a lot of standard db problems can you share that playlist so just go on youtube and search take you forward and search take you forward db playlist or just a search striver db playlist and you will get it i mean i can even do it here this one so you can check this out i can share the link here and again this is for interview preparation uh, it's not for heavy competitive programming but like what we've discussed in this session is like specific to competitive programming all right so any other doubt before we end this class i wanted to discuss the problem with intervals and maximum profit when i suggested to find subset and find maximum you can discuss that uh, before that are you from iit gandhinagar okay so let's do one thing let's discuss it offline that would be much better uh, right i would spend some time discussing you know normal ideas with you guys it's not like i will just take a problem solving session and i will go away i will be spending around 2 to 3 days at iit gandhinagar so you can always catch up with me and discuss stuff i mean that's the great part about having you know that whole offline thing fine and also if you are in tle eliminators then definitely you can like ping me on discord great so i see a message thanking me for this dp playlist and thank you for attending that's the best thing like not a lot of people are actually interested in this type of content uh but yeah you're welcome cool so i will end this class now and thank you so much for you know like taking out time and attending this entire dp boot camp uh, we talked about a lot of stuff uh, i would say it's around over 13 hours of content that we've covered in just 7 days and i mean i am not just proud of myself i am proud of you guys for attending you know all these lectures uh, and staying along till the end and that's actually commendable i i can just say that you know only 1% people would have stayed till this point because things did get really advanced uh, you know after lecture 3 so if you are attending these lectures even up till this point it's really commendable and i wish you the best of luck i hope you do great stuff in life so yeah cool bye bye i will end this recording or i'll just stop this recording now